You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. The Cauldron of Hate, a story by Grant Pachoco. Chapter 12. The next few weeks saw the Saddle River City death rays improve even more. They won their next three games against the Aragon Horses, the Cappuccino Cups, and the Hillsdale Maulers. Each game saw the Saddle River City death rays improve and saw their teamwork get better. Each win gave the team even more confidence and made them focus more on the next game and keeping their streak going. There was always the possibility of a loss. And it happened the next week when they played the Galileo Starlookers, who beat the Death Rays 3-1. This was a tough loss for the team, but it could be explained that it came about because Taylor had been sick that day and unable to play, and Arise had a clarinet recital that could not be rescheduled, so he had to miss as well. Chris filled in as goalie, but he didn't have the experience that Arise did, and though he stopped a few goals, most zoomed past him. The Blinding Skull, the Plant Lady, and the Living Lump were all very pleased with the team's performance. Look, you only let them score three times, the Blinding Skull said. It could have been much worse. You played with all you had and you didn't let them completely run all over us. It wasn't a blowout. Besides, the Living Lump added, you can't win them all. Look at the Cauldron of Hate's crime record. We never won any of them. This helped a little, but the team was still bummed out. Small cracks of doubt had begun to creep into their thoughts, no matter how much the Blinding Skull tried to convince them otherwise. The next week, however, Taylor and Arise were back, and the Saddle River City Death Rays trounced the San Mateo Sandwiches 4-0. This win put the Death Rays squarely in first place in the league and attracted the attention of a local sports writer who was eager to spice up the sports pages of his paper with word of the misfit soccer team being coached by three ex-supervillains. The article about the Saddle River City death rays ran in the penny pincher. It was Saddle River City's least circulated paper filled mostly with ads for used cars, dry dock boats, and unwanted pet snakes. Hardly anyone read it, and most issues of the usually 500 copy print run were recycled in local bird stores. The week the article about the team came out, however, there was a run on the issue and almost 32 copies were sold. Families of the team members bought multiple copies, and the article was cut out, mounted, and framed on the, until that point, bare wall of achievement in the hate pit. The blinding skull, the plant lady, and the living lump all stood and looked at the frame for a mighty long time. The plant lady couldn't be sure because of the glow, but she thought she saw the blinding skull wipe away a tear. Chapter 13 The reporters of all the major Saddle River City newspapers like to hang out at the Tower of Good the home base for the League of Good. They knew if they waited by the front doors long enough, one of the team members would come out and give them a quote they could run in the paper. Papers with the League of Good on the front page sold big numbers in Saddle River City. The town just loved its heroes. All the news agencies sent reporters to the tower by 6 a.m., and they camped out all day waiting for a quote. It had become such a regular occurrence, the League of Good had arranged for big pots of coffee, donuts, and porta potties to be a permanent fixture of what became known as Reporters Row. The League also had sandwiches sent down around lunchtime if they hadn't come out to make their quote. It was 10 a.m., and the reporters were involved in a gripping game of slapjack when suddenly Suprema swooped in and landed by the front door. The reporters immediately fell over themselves trying to grab a quote. Suprema, one question. Please, over here, Suprema. Suprema, Suprema. They all jockeyed for position in front of her. She stopped and lifted her hands up to get them to quiet down. She brushed her blonde locks out of her face and put her hands on her hips. Okay, boys, what do you want to know? Is there any truth to the rumor you're dating millionaire playboy Dirk Denton? No truth at all. Next question. Can we get a hint about your secret identity? A gal's got to have some secrets. Next. How do you keep your hair looking so fabulous? Wash and condition twice a day. Next. This went on for a good 15 minutes. Soon all the questions were exhausted. If that's all the questions you have, folks, I'll leave you to go write your articles. Just be sure to mention how great I am. A laugh went up from the reporters. Suprema turned to enter the Tower of Good when a lone voice spoke up from the back of the crowd. Suprema, uh, can I get your thoughts on the recent actions of the Cauldron of Hate? Suprema froze in her tracks and turned around slowly. Who asked that? 
The crowd of reporters parted, revealing a young man in his early 20s standing sheepishly in the clear. He pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose. I did. Suprema raised an eyebrow and slowly walked towards the reporter. You must be new here. Did you seriously just ask me about the cauldron of hate? The young man nodded. Yes, ma'am. I'm wondering if you had a comment on their recent activities. Young man, the cauldron of hate is no more. The League of Good humiliated them into retirement. If you'd have done your homework, perhaps you would know that. Well, actually, ma'am, they're still together. They are coaching a youth soccer team? There was an awkward silence, and then a big laugh went up from the gathered crowd. No one was laughing more than Suprema. Coaching a soccer team, she chuckled. Well, I certainly hope that they are better at it than they were at robbing banks. Another big laugh erupted from the crowd. Well, actually, they are, the reporter replied sheepishly. The other reporters all hushed as the look on Suprema's face became suddenly serious. What was that? She spoke slowly, biting each word. The young reporter cleared his throat as it dawned on him for the very first time that he was making Suprema upset. Not something you wanted to do. Well, you see, they are actually winning a lot of games, and it even looks as if they may have a shot at the city championship. Are you telling me that those... Losers are actually out there winning? The reporter flipped through his notepad. Um, yes, it seems that since the Blinding Skull, the Plant Lady, and the Living Lump took over as coaches of the team, they, well, they've only lost one game. Suprema stared at the reporter for a moment, dead in the eye. Several reporters took a step back, fearing a sonic blast from the hero. She restrained herself, though, and in an instant was through the front doors of the Tower of Good. There was a stunned silence among the reporters, and all of them stared at the still-swinging doors of the Tower of Good. Somewhere in the distance, a dog barked. Then, like a suddenly spooked herd of cattle, the reporters were gone back to their newspapers to begin filing their reports. The next morning, the papers were filled with headlines like, League of Good miffed at Cauldron of Hate Soccer Success! Cauldron of Hate Mounting Comeback? Hate Loves Soccer! Hate Does Bafo Soco! By early afternoon, the whole of Saddle River City was talking about the Cauldron of Hate and in a positive light. The Junior Youth Soccer Organization's offices were flooded for calls for interviews. Reporters wanted to know if the reports were true. Many called asking if they were insane for leaving children unattended with supervillains, but the JYSO assured everyone that they were being monitored and, it turns out, the villains were great with kids. At that evening's Saddle River City death race soccer practice, the Saddle River City police were called out to provide crowd control. Reporters, concerned citizens, and looky-loos had crowded the field and caused a major traffic snarl around the practice fields. The Junior Youth Soccer Organization had a strict policy that forbade the news media from questioning the players themselves, but, grateful for the sudden popularity in their program, they allowed the Cauldron of Hate to do a brief press conference after the practice was over. The blinding skull was beside himself with glee. His skull was glowing so brightly that the team had to break out the sunglasses the living lump had given them to shield themselves from the glare. The plant lady was cautiously optimistic at the news of their seemingly sudden popularity, and the living lump, well, his tummy just felt nervous. After the close of practice and the team members were safely paired with their parent or guardian, the cauldron of hate approached the bank of microphones the press had set up. As the blinding skull, with a great air of cockiness, tapped on each microphone to make sure they were working, the reporters all noisily shouted out questions. Well, this certainly is a surprise, the blinding skull smirked. I thought we were done, washed up and has-beens in this town, but apparently there's some interest in us still, eh? <laughs> the blinding skull laughed. The plant lady, the living lump, and myself chose as penance for our crimes to sponsor this youth soccer team. When their coach left them in a lurch, we stepped in as co-triple coaches and made sure they could continue to play. And play they have, and they have built up an impressive string of victories. These kids have heart. They have a passion for the game. They have a fine spirit of competitiveness that the city of Saddle River would do well to study. For the past few weeks, the Cauldron of Hate has decided on a new goal. Gone are the days of us trying to wreak havoc around the city. No, our goal is to simply take this fine group of men and women as far as they can go in the JYSO. And, if you ask us, they certainly do have the skills to go all the way. 
Now, I assume you have some questions, so please, fire away. The reporters all jockeyed for recognition. The blinding skull made a big show of looking at each one and pointing. Are your days of evil really in the past? Yes, our days of evil are in the past. I will not deny that as a team of supervillains, we didn't get much done, but as coaches to this group of young athletes, well, I, I do believe we may have found our true calling. Do the parents have any objections to their children being coached by a group calling themselves the Cauldron of Hate? Well, if they do, they certainly haven't expressed them to us. But why don't you ask them yourselves? They're all right here. The crowd looked over at the group of parents standing with the kids. Taylor's father, who stood behind her with his hands on her shoulders, removed his ball cap and smiled. At first, there may have been a little apprehension, but you can't argue with the results. These kids are playing fantastic, and if they keep winning, I ain't got no problem with them as coaches. The other parents nodded in agreement. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, an honest answer, the blinding skull grinned. Several months ago, the Cauldron of Hate was handed their ultimate defeat. We were humiliated in front of the world and we were called has-beens. As part of our deal with the courts, we took on the responsibilities of mentoring this soccer team and when the coach left, we stepped in. We have found in these children a new outlook on life. They are the future and here, through the sport of soccer, we are preparing them for that future. And they have taught us that there are no handouts in life. If you want something, you need to work for it. And for this lesson, we are eternally grateful to these fine young men and women. Whether we win or lose the season, it's all about how we played the game. I can tell you these children are playing the game the very best they can. And so are we. Now, if you'll excuse us, these kids need to get home to their families and homework. Good night, everyone. The reporters milled about for a bit, trying to get a soundbite or two from the parents as they herded their children to the cars. The Cauldron of Hate was left standing alone on the field. That was a nice speech, Skull, the plant lady said, patting him on the back. The blinding Skull nodded. It was quite good, wasn't it? Feels good to be on the good side of the press's graces for once. Yes, it does, replied the plant lady, who turned and directed her plants to begin collecting the cones and balls. The blinding Skull smirked. I wish I was a fly on the wall when the League of Good sees that speech. He chuckled to himself and turned to help with the cleanup. You've been listening to The Cauldron of Hate. To download a PDF of the chapter you just heard, visit cauldronofhate.com. The Cauldron of Hate was written by Grant Pachoco. The story was edited by Liz Brown, and the audio was edited by Steven Staver. Music by Dan Ring. Special thanks to all the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who make this content possible. And a special mention to those who support at the producer level, including Dorothy Pachoco, Eve Cunning, Kathy Crawford, Tony Urbano, David Akers, Jamie Donmeyer, and Vicki Sebring. To find out more about becoming a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. This episode is copyright 2021 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco Executive Producer, all rights reserved, www.saturdaymorningmedia.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.